there. That's fantastic, Mike. And, and Bowie. thanks for sharing that. I know I've heard that common story with, with David Bowie many times that he just like, he's like a seeker of people yeah. to work with. And like his last album, Black Star, I heard, I think Mark Juliana said he's in a, he's in a, if anybody knows the drummer, Mark Juliana, check him out. Yes. I, one of my biggest, biggest inspirations for sure. I love what he's all about. And he's got this band in New York city and yeah, same, almost similar story, but like they, like they were playing in this little club in New York city. And yeah, David Bowie's like, I'd, I'd love for you, like this band to be my band for my yeah. album, black star, almost yeah. identical story. Great album. Great album. Yeah, totally agree. And my connection, by the way, is I played in Toronto with this guy named Tony Springer. Yeah. Yeah. And Tony, same thing. He had his own trio. This is like, I was like 13 or something. This is like 1990, I think. And yeah. the boy was like in a hotel in Canada and he saw Tony's band at that time on like much music. If anybody knows much music, the MTV of Canada, <laughs> it's like pre-internet. Right. Yeah. And he just, yeah. Same thing. Like, like kind of, um, contacted Tony like, Hey man, I love what you're all about. Love to work with you. And in about 2006, I, I became the drummer in Tony's band and <laughs> Crap. yeah. And, and I was in that band for a long time, but yeah, I heard great stories of, of him and, you know, working with, with Bowie. Uh, that, that's amazing. Just love to, can you share anything like what you learned as a drummer from like Adrian, Adrian Ballou and even in Adrian, Adrian played in a Beatle band around here. I got to tell you, behind me is, uh, is a 1967 set of Black Oyster Pearl that I got about 12 years ago because I'm a total Ringo fan. That's the why I play drums. You know, when I was a kid, I saw uh, the Beatles on Ed Sullivan. But Adrian played in a Beatles band around this area. Wow. And they were fabulous. And he was the drummer. And he play and I and I'd go here and play all the time. And we got to be friends. And we ended up playing in a, you know, he got mononucleosis and he couldn't, he didn't have the strength to play drums. And he started learning Segovia on the guitar and started playing. And then he got better than all the guitar players around here. And then he started playing guitar. And uh but when we got this gig with with David, I got to tell you this, David, I was expecting this guy that would be totally impossible to work with, a total prima donna. But what I discovered was this guy was an unbelievably intelligent, beautiful guy. And he was he was well read. He told us where to go when we were on tour of all the great art museums and this and that and he was really nice to my mom when she came to see me play wow. and and he was just beautiful and when my mother died while i was on the tour he took care of everything and was just uh i i tell you what when david died in 2016 i heard about it i was listening to the radio and and i sat and cried like a six-year-old he was he was a friend and I and I he was a beautiful guy besides being a great talent and he was a, he was a great dude he really was and I miss him he was a great guy wow yeah thanks for sharing that i can feel the the impact he had on you it sounds like like even that that'll that's just a part of you yeah i i heard a i remember henry rollins uh it's one of my big inspirations like he told the story of some festival or something and, and he one of his heroes is david bowie and and very similar story like just of his kindness yeah just he said uh he was like so nervous to meet him and david just came up to him and was like oh man i, I just my name's david you know henry's like yeah i know you are <laughs> <It's> like, <laughs> yeah <right. laughs> hi my name's david uh, I, I really really love your writing and uh, do you want to talk to me for 10 minutes you know i'd love to just learn more about what you're about and just just very kind and humble yeah so I, I love these stories of 
you just hear these little things like, oh, he was really kind to my mom, you know, back yeah. to the gym, or he was, he was kind to this person at the Starbucks that gave him coffee or something. I, I love <laughs> yeah. really round that, you know, the character of a person, right? My, my mother was blown away by the buffet backstage. <laughs> she could, I said, Mom, you can have whatever you want. She just thought that was so great. That's awesome. What stayed, what impacted your drumming, Mike, that still stays with you today? Like, was it like keeping high standards, like a sense of time, maybe like being well, a servant hero or something? Yeah. Well, we had to play to film. So my playing with click track, you know, really was put to the test and, and, uh, and it was, it was great. I mean, you know, I, it, it was, it was a powerful band. You know, and, you know, I'm not, uh, you know, I'm a garage band drummer, you know, and, uh, and I, uh, I know some things, but, but I, you know, I try to play, uh, you know, what, what people are playing around me and integrate myself into that, you know, and, and David was beautiful with that, you know, he was, uh, he was very, he was very cool with, uh, he walked over one time, he goes, Michael, he said, it seems like the timing's off here. And I, and I said, we're playing the click track, David, you know? And he said, oh, <laughs> he walked away. <laughs> he said, oh, and, and he forgot, I you know, it. but it was, it was great. I'd love to, like, there's this thing in Toronto and it's called uh, F Up Nights. Yes. And uh, yeah, maybe, have you heard of it? No, but you, I've done it. <laughs> oh, cool. Yeah. And it's in, if you've heard of it, it's in multiple cities and, or maybe you're just thinking of a time like, yeah, I, could, I had, I had many of those. Like we can all. Yeah. With David. But, yeah. Well, actually, yeah, that leads to what I'm curious about is that this, this event in Toronto, what they do is they feature people from music, people from arts, people from tech, people from business. And they share like a failure that was one of their biggest learning experiences. Yeah. And I went up and shared the story. Like it's like the worst gig of all time. Uh, it's, you know, it started when this, I had to play this back line and this like old cat, like went inside the bass drum the night before and like <laughs> the bass drum. And they told me like, we didn't have time to get a new bass drum. Like you're just going to have to put up with it. So every time you hit the bass drum, like you're getting like, of distracting, you know, like, you know, the little girl on your face drum. And like the monitors were crazy. It was this big, this big gig at the time for, it was like a showcase gig for my band. Yeah. And we had depended so much, I depended so much on hearing the singer for cues that night. I could just see his back and all I could hear in my head, like we did sound check, everything's good. And then it's like, you hit the gig, it's like game time. And all of a sudden it's like, why do we even do sound check? Everything's completely freaking night and day, right? And we just start playing. I'm on this big stage, you know, stakes are so high. And all I hear is like, I can see the singer's back, his name is Shane. And all I can hear is like, <laughs> this is kind of like I'm underwater and I'm like, are we in the bridge or the like, I'm like, I think I know where we are. And then the bass player's looking at me like, what are you doing? You know, like he's kind of meditating for us. <laughs> Are you and I'm like, are we? And it just was this train wreck. I won't even go into it. But yeah, like everybody's probably feeling what this. If you have done something live, it's like, oh my god, that's you don't want to go to that that place. Yes, I have. Yeah. Okay. So so what? But that was one of my biggest learning experiences. Like I learned, yeah, like, like uh, just so many lessons about how to how to kind of keep everything on track. And, and it was one of the biggest learning experiences that F up. So I'm just curious, like these, these great artists you worked with, Mike, like, is there any like failures that you had that were? Well, it was always great because Adrian did such weird time signature stuff from working with King Crimson. Yeah. And, and, and the bass player and I, we were playing a trio and, and there was a couple of times I'd look at, I'd, I'd look at Mike, his name was Mike too. And I said, he doesn't know where he's at. <laughs> he wrote the song. And we're, you know, I mean, weird 
stuff. We did stuff in 11 and, you know, I mean, I, I like seven, but th there was some other things that were just very difficult. And then he would get lost and it would make us feel better, you know. But if you've ever gone on the wrong side of the, with David, we played Panic in Detroit one, one night. And, and there, was a, there was a percussion track that we were playing, you know, and it was sequenced. And, and I'm playing along, and I got on the other side of the beat, and I couldn't jump back. And David was walking around, and he knew something was wrong, and he didn't know who it was. But he knew. And I was trying to get to the point where I could, you know, it's like jumping rope, jump in, you know, or, and jump back out where, where you need to be. And I thought, I got to get this together, or I'm going to be on the bus going home tomorrow. And... Uh, you know, I got it straightened out. He never did know where that, what went wrong there. <laughs> Talk about handling pressure. Yeah, well, that was, that was cool. And you kept Tell it on the rails. Yeah. You kept it on the rails. Yeah, go ahead. What were you going to say? No, it was just, yeah, just, you know, it, it, I know people that would be better at uh, at jumping on back on the other side and getting where you needed to be, but it was I was so freaked out. And Adrian was looking around, going, he, and he knew, you know, he knew, and and because he's you know he's a drummer too, and he's a, actually a really good drummer, and uh, cool. So anyway, he's <laughs> he's looking at me like I'm gonna jump, I'm gonna <laughs> jump, I'm gonna get back in. And I did, and he would, he just gave me a look like, good job. Wow. You know, he kept it going. Yeah, it was uh, it was it was a beautiful thing. It really was. But you know what? Uh, I mean, we're sitting here all as drummers, you know, and and that's the beauty of this whole thing to be just to to play your instrument, you know. Yeah. And, and I mean, the first thing I see in the morning is this kit sitting behind me. And I have a few kits. And it's the last thing I see at night before I go into the bedroom. And it makes me happy knowing that I can still, you know, music business is challenging, man. Yeah. It really is. And you guys all know that. It really is. Most of my career, I've played locally. But, but I'll tell you what. It's a beautiful thing when it works and the band's clicking and they're walking around with a smile on their face and they know it's happening because of who's sitting on the, on the stool back there trying to make the groove work. Exactly. So many pe people, when we talk about goals, Mike, and like what inspires us, it's like the impression, it comes up over and over. It's like the impression we make on, you know, the audience, the band. Yeah. Of course, just everybody around us. So that's very powerful. Yeah. Just, just look at it and going, wow, like I am the heartbeat of this. <laughs> and like, and I love that you're also saying like, we're playing the long game here. You know, <laughs> yeah. right? like, yeah. This is the long game. And, and the first thing you look at in the morning and the last thing you look at at night and just keeping that, like you mentioned the Sullivan thing, like, you know, my, my, we talk about Dom Famulero here. Yes. Um, you know, oh. Yeah, and and he was he was my teacher and, and mentor, and same with a lot of people here. He had that same moment, you know, the 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 Beatles and Ed Sullivan, and that was like why it's like we call it the mighty why, like that was the spark. yes. And yes. just keeping keeping in touch with that for a lifetime is essential. Like that's what all the Yoda figures in drumming had, whether they were old men, you know, in their eighties and nineties, they were like little kids, people like Jim Chapin and course yeah gone. yeah so yeah. I, I love that i'm hearing that from you it's like man i look at this like ringo kit this blue oyster kit that's good. <laughs> and you remember where it started from yeah that's fantastic does anybody have any any questions for mike we're just really blessed that he's here with us today and we can you know we call this uh crowdsource wisdom where we can just learn from those around us yeah goran go ahead you got to, can you unmute yourself? And Goran is in Croatia representing. Wow, that's yeah. great. That's great. Yeah. 
if you're on a phone, it's a really tiny button. Okay, while he find while he sorts. Okay. There you go. There you okay. go. Yeah, Goran, welcome, my friend. <laughs> there you are. <laughs> oh, so, what was the question? <laughs> Do you have any questions for Mike? Yeah. Yes, I have. I have one question. In what year did he play with Adrian Blue? Uh, I started playing with Adrian in uh, '89 with uh, the uh, the Mr. Musichead tour, and then and then we went on the David Bowie tour in 1990, and then I played on the Inner Revolution tour in '92, with Adrian, and then the uh, Power Trio, a couple of them in 2005 and 2006. Thank you, Mike. Thank you. Go ahead, Joe. This is Joe from New Jersey, right? No, Long Island, New Jersey. Right here, Bruce Springsteen town. Yeah, I knew it. Yeah, great. <laughs> Mike, did you know, did you know Vinny Mad Dog Lopez? Who, Vinny? He was he was Bruce's. Um, he was he originally brought Bruce into he brought Bruce into the band. <clears throat> I forget what they were called before it became Bruce's band, but. Um, only because you look like him a little bit to me. I'm just I'm just seeing your face from a distance, so you just remind me a little bit of Vinny. But my question uh -huh. is, um, <clears throat> you know, I, I, we have a gig tonight. Maybe good for people. you. Yeah, <laughs> I don't. <laughs> <laughs> That's I great. But the money, yeah. a hundred bucks we make, I don't even see it, it goes right to my wife because she sings in the. <laughs> well, my guy just pays everything off, and I'm like, do you even get paid for that gig? And they're like, yeah, we got. <laughs> I never saw that. That's... Keep so, me more happy. Yeah. So it's um probably a hundred people, maybe 120, somewhere that it's a pretty it's that's a, cool, man. Nice bar. So what was the largest crowd? What was it like going from like I can't imagine doing a gig like this? And I'm stressed a little bit, you're nerved up because you don't want to screw up. And like hey, I'm playing church tomorrow. And, and uh, it's up at the at the at the big big church and stuff. There's about seats about fifteen hundred people. But it's a cool gig. I'm working with some cool people. It's a great band, you know. But the biggest place I ever played was in uh, Montreal, Sky Dome. No, Toronto. That's where the in the Toronto. That's where the Sky Dome is. That's a big one. And, and it was ninety-five thousand people. I think we played. You feel any different though in front of ninety-five thousand or fifteen hundred or a hundred? Or was it? Yeah, it scares the hell out of you. <laughs> I could, I could literally just grind, make make this grind to a halt if I screw this up. Yeah. But you know what? It was, I don't know. I, I just, I'll tell you what, if you lose that fear, you know, you're always going to feel a little anxious when you go out there and that's been a long time. But when you, when you, when you go out there and you get that many people into what you're doing and they give to you and you give back to them, Wow. There's nothing like that, man. There's nothing like that in the world. Thanks. Thank you. Do you take that Thank into you. the small gigs, Mike? Like that that give and take feeling? Absolutely. Yeah. Cool. Absolutely. You know, you're you're uh, you're cheating yourself if you don't. Exactly. If you don't bring your A game to everything you're doing, you're cheating yourself and everybody else. I hope everybody heard that. If you're not bringing your A game to everything you're doing, you're cheating yourself and everybody else. That was beautiful. I agree. And, and to me, every gig is sacred, whether it's like three people, yeah. even if I was busking on a street or I'm playing to, you know, Scott, yeah. right? And oh. you play in a worship band too, Mike, you said? Yeah, I've yeah. been there about nine years. This guy called me to fill in. And it's with where I used to go as a little kid. I used to sing in the choir when I was a I was a kid. It, and uh, and this guy calls me and said, "There's some drummer in town that recommended you." And I went and and I started playing. And it's a it's a much bigger church now, but I don't know. You know, it's it's a and I play a side project from that called Hippie House. We play a bunch of old hippie music, Hendrix and Led Zeppelin and all kinds of stuff. And, um, but I've, uh, I've learned a lot from uh, being in the, the church band up there. It's a whole different way of drumming. 
Yeah, it's that it's because uh, I I went to a Catholic school when I was a kid and it was like white robes, organ music, not a drum in sight. Yes. <laughs> right? But yeah. now, there's a really cool community church in 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 my town and like killer band and like cool vibe. And it's like the whole energy is like, let's let's serve something higher with our music. Yeah, there's some good bands. There's some really good Christian yeah. bands. And that's something I do, and it's and it's uh, it yep. taps into that feeling of like what you're saying, like giving out and giving back, and and just what the the real deeper meaning of music. That's that's fantastic. You have to learn a lot of Tom figures. It's very tribal. Some some Probably, you yeah. know, yeah. <laughs> they always got the Tom thing. Can you you know figures that you have to learn? But it's cool. I've learned a lot from doing it. Yeah, my, myself too. I'm curious. Uh, yeah, and anybody with questions, just just we'll jump in. But I'm just just from what you said about Joe's question of playing in front of all those people. So a big part of what we do as drummers, I believe, is like facing fear, and the fear yeah. can be like, wow, like what if you know, what if I'm laughed at, or like, wow, I'm in front of these people. What if I'm scared to be myself? You know, scared to be what makes me an individual? Uh, what if I mess up in the band? What if I play a fill? And or what if I'm called to do a solo? And facing fear is such a big part of what we do. And that's why like a, a while ago, we had as a special guest, uh, this Navy SEAL, David Rutherford. Yeah. And he was like, man, first I got this call about this drummer wanted me to do your podcast. He's like, I didn't I like, that's a first. But then he's like, I told you to get it <laughs> because you know, we face fear with what we do and we can, you can use a lot of those tools in your drumming. So one thing we do here is like breathing exercises and, you know, yeah. down. And I know I, I did this uh, Cirque du Soleil gig years ago called Cavalia. And I was wow. terrified, Mike, because it was, I'd never done anything like that. Yeah. And it's like countdown to opening night. And I'm in my hotel and I can see like the, the tent, you know, a few blocks away. I'm like, it's like facing like Darth Vader in Star Wars. Like, I'm gonna have to face this. Holy crap! And uh, just, I'm just curious, like ways to handle, like even you know, your first gig with Bowie it must have been like, oh my gosh, like this is the moment. We're on in five minutes or something, you know, and everybody's dependent on me, and I'm playing with a click. Like just ways to handle pressure and to overcome fear. Just any tools that you picked up along the way. Well, we were uh, we were in Great Neck. Uh, we 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 were at, at the end of uh, uh, rehearsal, and and we and the band had it. We had it pretty happening, and the film crew weren't getting the sympathy code right, and it wasn't syncing up right. And I remember it scared me to death. Because I really wanted to go on this tour. And David got on the microphone. And it's one of the few times I ever seen him get mad. But he said, if this isn't right tomorrow, we're all going home. I mean, he meant it too. And those guys and, and girls that worked on that crew, they stayed up all night and got it together. And we rehearsed the next day and it was perfect. And uh, and because everybody wanted to do this, you know, when you're up there and if you stand, that fear starts. As somebody told me a long time ago, there's only two, you know, intense. It's it's love. It's not love and hate. It's love and fear. Mm -hmm. You're either acting out of love or you're afraid. And when you're afraid, it takes from you, you know. And so I started going, man. When, when when we start going out on stage, I'm going, this is so cool. I can't believe this. This is unbelievable. And 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 just loving what I was doing. You know, I remember a long time ago, I the first concert I ever I ever saw when I was a kid. Well, I wasn't a kid, I was I was a little older and I'd been playing drums and I saw the Who play at Music Hall in Cincinnati. And and I remember seeing those little flashlights going across the stage, you know, and, and, and it's the tech 
taking the the people that they're teching for over there to their instrument. Mm -hmm. And I sat there and, and I I've been playing a while and I thought that is the coolest thing ever, you know, and they're leading them over to the drums and the, and the tech would give me a fresh pair of sticks and he, and he pat me on the back and then we'd go. And then, and we count, we did space oddity was usually the first song and, and we'd go and I, and I would, that fear would melt because of the love I had for what was going down. I love to play music, you wow. know, and always have. So I'm hearing you really tapping into, again, it goes back to that kit behind you. It's the first thing you see in the morning, the last thing you see at night. Yeah. You know, like totems, Mike, like having, you know, just, just things around you. Like it could be the drums themselves. Sabian. <laughs> yeah like actual exactly i recognize <laughs> great yeah like it, it's it's the it's the magic factor you know i'm i have this this photo of me in like a sabian shirt when i was nine you know yes just, that's like, cool like, like i can still feel that like yeah right on that love well you know what we're doing any of us that you know we're 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 channeling something it when i'm playing the best I play things that I don't even know. Right. I, I've I had the experience many times being playing and going, I don't think I've ever played this. I don't know this. Wow. But somehow I turned it over and something I got me out of the way, my fear and my my worry about somebody's gonna think this is stupid, what I'm doing, or whatever it is, what you were talking about, to that whole thing it flows through you yeah. and, and, the, and, and, and it comes through you and goes out into the world. And I'll tell you what, there's been times that it just blew my mind what happened. And I thought, Oh my God, I sure hope I do that again. Cause that was really cool. <laughs> so, uh, well, funny yeah. you should say that because we're, we're in the middle of a multi series and it started, you can't, you know, it started out as one or two and like, there's, it, it's so deep. I'm going to do this over like two months or something. Yeah. It's on Mike, it's on flow and how to get to flow, flow around the kit and also get into flow state, which is exactly what you just described so perfectly. Yeah. And, you know, there's some specifics, like we're getting into like, you know, feet and just feeling drumming from the feet and being very balanced because that's a flow killer you know yeah. if, you're, if you're off balance <laughs> and uh of course breathing and and you know relaxation and drumming and of course how we how we get around our instrument which is the the kind of dancing of it right and we're doing exercises and you know breathing and and but i'm just curious like how do you like you just mentioned it man you're, you're almost watching yourself play Oh my gosh, I've never played this before. I hope it happens again. And sometimes it doesn't. You know? And I even sometimes talk to my favorite drummers, you know, after, you know, a gig or something. And like, if you're lucky enough to meet them, like, hey, what was that thing you played after such and such song? Sometimes it's always like, I have no idea. No idea. You have to watch the tape, you know? Yeah. Just like how do uh, what's your experience of yeah flow and drumming and 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 maybe some things you've overcome that have gotten you to a better place and just flowing around the kit getting into flow states. Well, I'll tell you, I'll tell you one thing that that I have uh, done for the last six years, and you know I've always just played a single pedal, you know. A la John Bonham and 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 many people that that's been great with their feet, yeah. foot and feet, and uh, and I started having a problem with my calf, and I went to all kinds, tried to get help, uh, sports medicine people, chiropractors, you know, uh, kinesiology, you know, acupuncture, and all kinds of stuff, and somebody said to me one time. I think it was a chiropractor and he looked at me and he said, I know you're having a lot of trouble. And it almost, 
took me out as far as I'm going to quit playing. I can't. Uh, it, it's called focal dystonia. And, and where from repetition, it messes up the, the lineage from the, your, your nerves, you know, your brain sending things through the nerves. And it's not, uh, it's not getting the message right. You do things you don't want to do and you don't do things you want to do. And he said, well, why don't you just uh, play with your left foot? <laughs> and I just almost I said, what? You know? And he wow. said, yeah. And you know what? I read a thing that guy in the Dap Kings did this. Oh. He put his high hat down. He bought a double pedal. I don't buy the, I don't play the double pedal for that, you know, to, to show amazing. Oh, I'm doing this because I, <laughs> I don't and I can't. But I play with my left foot and I integrate my right foot because it, it works, but but it, it gets, you know, weird. And, and I use my left foot predominantly and then i play right-handed which is weird but it just in the past maybe year i'm starting to go i think i'm getting the hang of this and and rather than quit i went ahead and did something totally different and uh i'm glad i did because i came this close to, to leaving what i love dearly in life Oh because God. I had this injury and I couldn't play what I wanted to play. And some guy just went, Hey, why don't you do it this way? And I thought, what? But he was right. He was exactly right. Deal wow. with it. That's, that's, that's so inspiring, Mike. And, and taking like a, yeah, like you, you came this close to quitting and I'm yeah. thank, thank, I'm so thankful you didn't. And we we're just talking yesterday about like that ability to flip things and take like a so-called weakness into a strength. There's a right. Rima in the community. Just yesterday, she said she had some challenges with her ankle and she's yeah. the same thing you're doing. She's like, but she's getting actually a double bass, like another bass drum. She's like, I'm going to work my left foot in there. And I love the vibe of having like two bass drums. Cause I'm <laughs> yeah, like, it's like this, this vibe she, like, you know, the double bass energy there. And yeah, we were talking about all these examples, like, like Joni Mitchell, you know, she was, she had polio when she was a kid. Yeah. She just lost the ability to kind of play chords, like, you know, so-called normal guitar. So she just developed this new way of tuning where she wouldn't have to put her fingers in that shape. And that became the Joni Mitchell sound. That yeah. was love and so she took a weakness and flipped it into a strength so that's that's so inspiring well the the guitar player i i i didn't i don't know if you're aware of this but i i heard the story and he was talking about in an interview it's tony iomi yeah from a uh, black sabbath and he working in a factory he sawed off a couple ends of his fingers <laughs> yeah. and and he and he'd been playing he's going well this is this is uh, troublesome and he didn't know how he was going to do anything and so he ended up you know l learning to play like that like you just said with Joni Mitchell and guess what it's uh he's got a, a very unique style exactly that's the whole mission here is like bringing out yes be who you are yeah man exactly who's got a question for Mike yeah, Joe. Uh, not a question, but, um, <clears throat> you know, the fact that you had to switch feet. Mm -hmm. <laughs> there was a gig I played maybe six months ago, and, and my double pedal broke. Um, the main right beater <laughs> broke, so the left still worked. Yeah. And I'm trying to <laughs> <laughs> so so play with the left foot. That it, we were luckily it kind of broke somewhere in the second set. So the third set, I started out that way, and then it was just too hard. So I literally played side saddle with my right yeah. foot on my left pedal. And my left oh. foot on my high hat and played the rest of the gig that way because it's like it's that's that's to make that transition to the left foot is and you said six years now right you've been been working on that uh, yeah it's hard it's hard and i love I the you, question yeah go ahead I, just one point that i want to underline there i love that you left foot playing but you're like i'm playing right-handed like there's no rules to this stuff you know this is that's like, right thank you, you. Yeah, like Andrea here from Germany, she similar thing. She was 
you know, having some teachers, ah, oh, you got to do it this way. And, and it's like, no, the only rule is that there's no rules. Like put the hi hat here. You can play with this foot. We're like freaking octopuses here. It's like, there's no rules here. Yes. I, I Keith Moon, it. Keith Moon didn't have a hi hat. <laughs> yeah. Hey, Chris, you mentioned about sounding like ourselves. I think it was Miles Davis said, yes. uh, paraphrasing here <laughs> that it's amazing how long it takes to sound like yourself. <laughs> yeah, that's great. That is great. Yeah, jo Jojo Mayer said once, he's, I never forgot this, like, it took me 10 years to sound like Tony Williams, and then another 10 years to undo that and sound like yourself. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> Tony I, Williams I will always you, sound better. I told you. I told you that. You, gave <laughs> I heard you stole it from me. Did I steal it from you? Yes, you steal it from me. <laughs> oh, Actually, right. I, I saw you. You have, a, you have a, you have a weak memory. <laughs> Big Jojo has probably said that repeatedly because I, I, I saw him say that at a clinic actually to a crowd. And did did you hear him say that too? And go ahead with your question, by the way, Goran. Thank you. Uh, I have a question for Mike uh, regarding your big shows at 90,000 people. Uh, I, I'm i interested in how was your monitoring on stage big like this? You know? Yeah, in that, those, that can, in those, yeah. can you, can you, did you play, for example, and entitled Absolute Beginner? Well, I had, I had had some uh, experience with click track from playing a, a a gig with Adrian beforehand, but the monitoring thing when the crowd and this can be a real problem when 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 it got really loud, you know, and I mean it's you know, and I was you know you need to protect your ears, but um, but it got so loud sometimes that the click track, I had the tech provide a light along with the click mm -hmm. so i could he i could see the light you know and did and you, and because if did you, you did you did you hear drums well oh yeah i mean I, you know it's like uh i remember turning around one one night to the uh monitor guy seth and i said seth Give me some more monitor. I, I need to hear, you know, hear, hear some more monitor, and especially for the kick. You got to have that happening. And, and he said, that's all I can give you, man. And he said, just hit harder. <laughs> and so <laughs> I played one more song and I broke, I broke a pearl pedal in half. And I said, wow. is this hard enough? You know, well, the, the tech took it off and he, you know, yeah, is that hard enough? It, it's it can be a real problem getting enough, uh, and you know, even though it's hard to keep the stage volume down, but you, a lot of bands are trying to do that these days. It's it's not a battle of volume, because you always lose. Yes, yes, I, and I they have got a, another. Uh, I have another uh, quick question, please. Uh, just a quick sure. Question. You, uh, you you said it that you're from the Cincinnati area. Well, I'm from the Kentucky side of uh, of Cincinnati. <laughs> I'm in the, the tri-state area. I, you know, I'm I live in Kentucky, in Union, Kentucky. I was born and raised in Kentucky, but I played around Cincinnati, which is just right across the river. You know, all I, my I early I, career. I, I don't know. I don't know. Is it polite in your country to ask? But may I ask you, how old are you? I'm seventy-two. Years young. So yeah, well, you know, you, you, you are, you on, are, on most you days, are, some days, <laughs> some days, no, not so much. You yeah, are, I've, then, I've then, been playing fifty-five years or then fifty. You are, then you are uh, maybe aware of uh, Philip Paul, a drummer. Died a few years ago. Who's this? Philip Paul Philip. Oh yeah, drama. You know of him? No. No, the the maker of the twist beat from Connecticut. 
He was ninety six what was his, years. What, what was his name again? Uh, his his name was Philip Paul. Paul Philip. Oh wait a minute, Philip Philip Paul from Cincinnati. Yeah, yes. I played. Yeah, I I went to I saw him play in a little club, and and uh, I was the I was the drummer that played the King Records tribute thing. That for K and he played a lot of stuff on King Records, and he came out and played with Otis Williams and the Charms. But I was yeah. playing with. Uh, you know, all these different bands that came up to tribute for King Records. Yeah, I, I misunderstood what you were thank saying. You. Yeah, yeah he's, he was a really good drummer. Thank you. Thank you. I have a yeah, Abdallah, yes. go for it. Then Joe's uh, next. Mike, thank you again for, for being here with us. Yes. This is wonderful, man. Um, My pleasure. Thank you, thank you. Um, Mike, uh, when when you're on a tour what kind of things do you find yourself doing to to stay healthy and men mentally positive on an extended tour when you're jet lagged when yeah great question eat right work yeah. out i mean it's the same stuff you get here you know you you're but I think a lot of people don't realize they think, well, you're on tour and people are setting your gear up and that's great. I'll, I'll tell you what, that's not lost on me. That's wonderful. It doesn't happen now, but, uh, but you know, just to find some place that well, I don't care if it's just going for a walk, we play physical instruments, mm -hmm. you know, and, and you got to have some level and, 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 and what Chris was talking about, and what you guys have been talking about here recently, to be fluid on the drum set takes takes a lot of, of work to stay in shape. Not to be some muscle person or anything, but just to stay fluid on your instrument, to play with authority. Mm -hmm. You know, if I get up there and I'm playing milk toast, and I'm not talking about being loud, I'm talking about hitting the drums and making them sound good. There's a trick to that, and and I know you all know that, you know, because people get up there sometimes. Somebody, hey man, I play drums, <laughs> okay, and they get up and and I I I told my wife one time, well, I'm not married now, but but she said I said, uh, does my drums sound like that? Because if they do, I'm gonna sell them tomorrow. <laughs> and she said, no when you play them they sound different because there's a touch man to to play in drums yeah. and yes you got to have a nice instrument but that makes it easier to get what you need to hear and what you want to project out to the audience you know i don't I, I i work really hard at trying to make the drums sound good and and to play them correctly for me and that's different for everybody, but to make them project and to sound good, your instrument needs to sound good too. That's half the fun. Yes. Yeah. One of the one of the things that I have a hard time with is when playing a show, is the actual the the, the PA system being loud and a crowd. Yeah. I, I get overloaded and I, I try to go find a quiet place away from the club or whatever. And uh, I, I always find it hard to one, find that quiet place, especially in a town that I don't know. And two, uh, to not get overloaded by the crowd, the PA system, the, you know, how hectic hectic things get. Um, that's something I find difficult is to, 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 to deal with all of that. Plus playing the show to the top of my ability. Yeah. yeah. Uh, we, we play a loud instrument, but, uh, <laughs> you know, we, I, we probably all got that a lot of times Well, you're playing the drum, they're loud. So yeah, I get it. But I'll tell you what, you get a Marshall stack 
you know, happening and going your way and and uh, a, a B3 coming through a Leslie in your ear. I mean, we all, but we all got to be work together at trying to, to keep a, uh, you don't want to play milk toast, but I don't want white, I don't want to be up on stage and all of a sudden it becomes white noise. Do you like that? I don't. No, no. I, I'm, you know, I want to, I want to hear music. I think, you know, and it's like, hey, everybody, let's not, let's not battle each other. Come on, man. We can, we can, you know, th that's why we have a sound engineer. That's why we have monitor people. They're trying to work with us. And if we're just, just cranking it up, you know, like in the spinal tap, turning it up on 12 and sawing the knobs off, you know, <laughs> no, you know, I'm, <laughs> I want to be able to hear, you know, and yeah, I, I've lost some hearing and stuff over the years, but I still love to play. And, and, uh, and I'm playing with some people right now, the side project from the, from the church band. And even the people in the church band, we're trying to keep it at a, have some dynamics, you know, yeah. boy, that is important, man. I've, I've had people say, well, you, you don't play the same volume all the time. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> thank you, exactly. Thank you. I, I, I've been working on that. Yeah. <laughs> you know? you. Appreciate it. That's a really big compliment. Yeah. Joe, do you have a question? Or anybody else? Uh, you have probably five more since the... Uh, yeah, I know. <laughs> Me too. I'll, I'll try to go back to the one. You know, it's, it's funny, Chris, the first time I met you and we had that little guy on, and you were asking me, like, I think the first thing I said was, you got to listen to the band, right? Like, right. you got to be able to bring it up and bring it down and, and really feel yes. what's going on. And that, God, Mike, I'm, I've been probably playing since I was eight, so I'm 60, so 52 years. You only got me beat by three, but you got me in a few more years on the other side. <laughs> um, I get my, my well, you look great. Oh, thanks. My, <laughs> my original question going back was, are you? did you get it on any of his recordings? Are you on any of his albums, or was that just for... No, well, I'm on I'm on some CDs and stuff. Uh, it, it's from the live stuff from the Sound and Vision tour in 1990. You know, I actually found an album. I was it, it was in an email. You know those uh, those things they put those compilations together, and I and it said David Bowie at the Tokyo Dome, and I went. I looked at the date, and I thought, well, I played on there. It was 1990. And so I ended up buying an album and, and look, awesome. mom, I'm on the album, you know, cool is that? but, but I mean, my mom's gone. She didn't get to see that, but, but yeah, it's, it's cool. I mean, you know, I didn't play any of the uh, original recordings, but I did the live stuff. Yeah. Outstanding. I had, I had a question about, um, this would be Adrian blue related to that. Like, so odd times is, is always a thing that comes up and not not kind of getting stuck into overthinking and where you're in your head you know to get into flow and yeah. not have something like odd times get in the way and really just to make odd times feel like yes before. like i've heard some great drummers play that and that's my approach and uh for me the tool i use is uh is is conical so if you know the the indian system of of you know speaking the syllables like takadimi takita and yeah hey it came goran ordered the book taladiddle from klaus hessler and klaus uh claudio spieler and it's all on it's kind of uniting conical and rudiments yeah that's I, I, adrian had a song called happy to be happy with what you have to be happy with and when you sing it it's 11. You know, uh, it's, I, you know, I find odd time signatures fascinating and they're fun to play and they're very musical. But when, when it's, uh, when you can flow, like you were talking about, Chris, but when it's contrived that just to see how difficult they can make it, it doesn't sound good to me, you know, oh, and, no. uh, it just doesn't sound, you know, uh, and, and Adrian did a good job at doing, I mean, he, you know, he wrote some of that stuff for King Crimson, 
Yeah. And, uh, and I was thinking, are we going to be playing some of that? And he said, yeah. I went, oh, good. Oh, great. And you know what? And I got to say this. This was it just made me feel so good. We were doing some song called uh, I Remember How to Forget. And it had two weird time signatures going on. And they they kind of met each other. And, and, and I was having trouble with it. And, and I, we were at rehearsal down in this place in Nashville. And I said to, uh, I said to Adrian, I said, well, I bet Bill Bruford didn't have a problem with this. And he said, no, he did. <laughs> wow. And I went, oh, good. Bill, if Bill had a problem with it and I got a problem with it, I'm cool. That's great. But <laughs> that's all. Chris, last one for me. Yeah, sure. Is there, Mike, is there, is there like, do you have a drummer that is your main guy who's like your idol drummer? Ringo. Ringo? Yeah, I mean, there's people like Vinny and Dave Weckl and, and all those guys, and I love them. And Nika Niles, that, that girl from, uh, yeah. is she from Germany? Oh, my God. Yeah. You know? Uh, there, there's so there's so many great drummers, but but Ringo was the open door. I saw Ringo, and that was it. And it never ever changed. That's I said. I said that's what I want to do, and it's been what I wanted to do my whole life. Yeah. Does that grow with with? time for you mike because i love how without hesitation you just said like ringo and for me like i i, I love this band the bad brains if anybody's thumbs up for the bad brains man and yeah. i ever since i was a kid and literally this morning i'm listening to them again and it's like this just grows with every year like i love this band more and more over time yeah you know, it's definitely like that to people like the just each year that passes so is that is that kind of the the vibe with Ringo, like you just grow. I, I love grow. playing drums. I love, I love the art of drumming uh, more than I did when I first started, you know, and, and I tell people, I, you know, and they, they said, they're, you know, that's got to be old hat. You've been playing 50 some years and I'm going, you know, I'm still like a little kid. You know, I've, I've talked to Abdallah and we, we've been talking about something we probably shouldn't be talking about. These new drums that have come along. And I was just curious. And I I'm sent a curi them an email, by the way. Huh? You got I, I more information? Them. Yeah. We're going to, your wife's going to kill you. Uh, <laughs> I'm going to blame you, man. <laughs> okay, good. Just blame it on me. I live by myself. <laughs> but anyway, yeah, I, I love it more than I ever did. And I can't. I, I, I got to tell you this real quick. I was playing this club, and, and I had this set of drums. They were Aot from Canada, and uh, and anyway, uh, I was playing playing this kit, and I was talking to this drummer, and he was facing this, and he was facing me, and I was facing the stage, and and we were talking. And his name was Marty, and I and we were talking shop. You know how drummers do. And I kept looking over his shoulder and he said, are you looking at your drums? <laughs> and I said, busted. Yeah, I am. I was I just thinking how, how cool they looked up there. <laughs> I do that too. I, do the exact I know. Same thing. I'm like, I hope no one notices. Like I'm kind of like staring at my own drums, but they look cool. I get that feeling too. I used to draw them when I was a kid before I ever played drums, uh, you know, and, 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 and I'd seen Ringo on, on Ed Sullivan and it's before I played. And I draw, draw amps and I draw and like write the Ludwig logo on there. And yeah, uh, I know it's great, isn't it? I love it. We say it's the fountain of youth, Mike. So I love feeling that like you just tapped right in there, man. And it's just growing with every. Yeah, it is. And I love what you said about odd times, how it's like singing them and making them musical and just making them, them feel good. And yeah. that's fantastic. So as we wrap up today, we're actually in so multi part series of flow. So Mike, you're welcome to jump on any, any time and 
thank you so much for contributing to thank that. you man this has been just a very cool to meet you all it, it's it's just it's a beautiful thing I, you know i i got to do just the update section of modern drummer never got a feature article but but robin flan said to me one time she said I, you know i was in la and she was talking to me over the phone and she said I just want to tell you this about drummers. She said, I've interviewed a lot of drummers and I want to say that the drumming, the drumming community is the most open and, and willing to share everything they know about their instrument and, and their art exactly. to any other drummer without hesitation. And she said, I, I don't see that in hardly any other instrument. She said, I'm not knocking any of it. And and but she said you you drumming people are a special breed of cat, and I thought well thank you very much I'm I'm honored to be here you know yeah amazing <laughs> guys let's clap it up for Mike thank you so much for being here Mike like, oh thank you such an honor thank you. and we will see you soon.